So today I'm going to give you a summary of a source characterization study that we did for metals in a wastewater conveyance, a binational wastewater conveyance, very similar to what uh, the Watershed Protection Unit does, trying to go out, sample, identify sources, and then mitigate. Only I did it in an urban setting and my, my focus was specific to wastewater. So the area I'm going to talk about is Ambos Nogales, which is located in uh, southeastern Arizona. This is the Ambos Nogales watershed, and you can see that uh, that, that watershed drains into the uh, Santa Cruz River about 10 miles north of the border. This is the Santa Cruz River watershed. So just to kind of give you kind of a, a, a bearing with respect to the area that, uh, that I worked in. So now we're zoomed in a little bit more uh, on the watershed. You can see here that, uh, that there's this drainage called the Nogales Wash that hooks up with the Santa Cruz River about 10 miles north of the border. And south of the border in this watershed, there's a population of about 300,000 people and everything flows north. So they're allowed under binational treaty minute 276 to deliver up to 9.9 .9 million gallons per day of wastewater to Arizona for treatment and discharge in Arizona. Um, that's basically done through a big pipe that they call El Emisor Central in uh, Nogales, Sonora. And then on the Arizona side of the border, we've got a much smaller population, about an order of magnitude less, and they're allocated about 4.84 million gallons per day of wastewater that they can have uh, treated at a facility in Rio Rico. And that is all conveyed via, via what's known as the International Outfall Interceptor. And I'm sure you guys have heard about the International Out Outfall Interceptor in the news. It's, it's and the Nogales Wash. It, it, it surfaces every monsoon because of some of the issues I'll talk about. So all that wastewater is treated by the Nogales International Wastewater Treatment Plant. It has a treatment capacity of 14.74 MGD. And it discharges uh, to the Santa Cruz River. And because it discharges the Santa Cruz River, of course, it carries an AZIPTES permit and also has an APP. Now, you can imagine that this is kind of challenging for the facility operator, which is the International Boundary and Water Commission, because, uh, you know, under treaty, they're, they're basically receiving 75% of their influence from another country that has different regulatory standards, uh, doesn't have the resources to actually make sure that that wastewater is treated properly or before it's discharged. So this is kind of a, kind of a conceptual diagram to show you what it looks like. Uh, you know, Nogales Sonora is allowed to deliver about 75% of the wastewater treatment capacity, the Nogales International. They actually deliver more like 90. So 9.9 .9 under treaty, but actually they're actually delivering about 12 MGD to the wastewater treatment plant. But we'll take it because if you can tell from this slide that uh, that treated wastewater is actually being discharged the Santa Cruz River, which is good for us, supports an important bird area. It's recharging the Santa Cruz uh, active management area. It's a good thing for, for, for Arizona to be receiving this wastewater. Uh, this is the Santa Cruz River downstream of that uh, Nogales International Wastewater Treatment Plant. It's hosting the endangered Gila top minnow. It's one of the last remaining cottonwood willow habitats in Arizona. It's designated an important bird area by the Audubon Society. Um, what else? It's designated as critical habitat for the endangered southwest willow flycatcher. I mean, this river is really important to us. And again, remember that 90% of the flow that's being discharged to this river comes from Mexico. With respect to you know, all the agricultural, municipal, industrial, and riparian uses, 38% in a typical year of that water that serves all those purposes comes from Mexico. 38% of the Santa Cruz Active Management Area recharge. That's a big deal. One thing that I should mention is that Mexico has no obligation to send any wastewater to Arizona. Under Minute 276, they can keep all that water south of the border. They can pump it uphill. In fact, they do pump some of it uphill, and they can treat it on their side of the border, and they can get the benefits that I just discussed, keeping those benefits south of the border. And there was a study that was done by the USGS regarding what would happen if Mexico decided to keep all that wastewater south of the border. And they indicated that the perennial extent could decrease from 18 to 6.3 miles, depending on the time of year. In fact, we've already seen some diminishment of the perennial extent because of the fact that the wastewater treatment plant did a major upgrade and they're getting better infiltration downstream of their outfall. And this is the difference between what a perennial stretch of the Santa Cruz River looks like versus ephemeral. Uh, this was back in 2004. This is now in 2016. So you can see there's a pretty big difference. 
Um, they also looked at um, you know, what the value of that effluent is in a paper that was published in Water. And they say that the value of that 12 million gallons per day is about $11 million with respect to what it does to real estate values. The uh, value of effluent for domestic water supply is about 1.61 million, and uh, the recharge value is about 513,000 per year. So if we neglect impacts on real estate values, which are just kind of like a one-time fixed cost, really what we're talking about is $2.12 million worth of benefit, worth of ecosystem services that Arizona receives from that 12 million gallons per day that's discharged to the Santa, uh, Santa Cruz River. Um, you know, it's all good, but there are also some challenges. In Nogales, Sonora, one of the reasons we have 300,000 people living directly south of the border is because of NAFTA and the fact that we have all these um, maquiladoras manufacturing a lot of the goods that we consume here in the U.S. And you can see that they can, they can expose their process water to hexavalent chromium, to nickel, to cadmium, to copper, to zinc. In fact, these are the same metals that we're seeing in that wastewater coming across the line. Now, I mentioned that uh, the wastewater treatment plant has an AZIPTES permit. We require them in special conditions of the AZIPTES permit to do monitoring at manhole one, at the headworks of the plant, and at the discharge. 30 days continuous, um, auto samplers doing 24-hour composites. But this is a gold mine of data in terms of actions that we take to try to mitigate metals coming from Mexico and to see if it actually makes a difference. So um, I can tell you that from that data that they collect, the, the metals that we're dealing with that are consistently in wastewater at levels that, that impair the operational efficiency of the wastewater treatment plant are nickel, chromium, copper, and zinc. And they're at levels that are way too high. In fact, this is a, an example of the data that they submit to us on a quarterly basis. You can see here at manhole one, which is right at the border with Mexico, this is the goal. This is what Mexico's allowed to discharge to the IOI at the border. And this is what's actually coming in. And at these levels, we'll impair the effluent of the discharges. What about the effluent? Um, so one thing that we've done is, uh, this was actually uh, a graphic that I would use when I was working for my old unit to kind of track how we're doing uh, with respect to metal loadings, in particular nickel, and I'll talk about nickel in a minute. But this is that graph integrated for the month. And the blue line is what's coming in from Mexico at manhole one, and then the orange line is what we actually discharge in effluent. And what you can see here quite clearly from that data is that when we get spikes in metals for a, for a given quarter coming in from Mexico, that the, what's discharged the Santa Cruz River kind of tracks that. So that indicates to us that Mexico is a source of problems with respect to uh, uh, NOVs that IBWC has had for the plant with respect to metals discharges. At Trevor Bajori's request, I went ahead and I actually summed up close to 22,000 kilograms of metals that came in that we monitored or that we required IBWC to monitor on a quarterly basis. This isn't even for the whole year. That's a lot of metal coming in from Mexico. And then what gets discharged to the Santa Cruz River is about 6,200 kilograms, right, for that period. So you, your question would probably be, well, where's the balance? Where did the rest of the metals go? Well, where it ends up in is the biosolids of the wastewater treatment plant. And sure enough, the wastewater treatment plant is not allowed to land apply their biosolids in their current AZIPTES permit because they're contaminated with metals, not at a level that's considered hazardous, but at a level that's high enough that they can't land apply their, their biosolids. This is the distribution of metals uh, with respect to what's coming in from Mexico and what's being discharged to the river. And you can see that in terms of mass, that the big one is zinc, but the next big one is nickel. And nickel's a problem, and I'll, I'll, we'll talk more about it in a second. But this kind of shows you, uh, you know, what the distribution of those metals are that are coming in from Mexico and what's being discharged. Now, that's only based on the quarterly monitoring data that we collect. If you kind of extrapolate that for all the periods that we aren't asking IBWC to monitor, this is probably closer to what's coming in across the border, 50,000 kilograms over the last, or over that eight year period from Mexico and 14,000 kilograms being discharged at the Santa Cruz River. So I started doing some research and, and came across this study that was done by the USGS. And what they did is they looked at the concentration of metals in uh, the feathers and the blood of non-migratory sparrows. This is an indicator of metals accumulation in the watershed in specific areas. And sure enough, what they found was at the Nogales International Wastewater Treatment Plant that cadmium and nickel 
actually exceeded um, background concentrations in other areas that weren't impacted by industry or development or, or other areas. It's a great paper. I won't go into all the details of it, but that was a big takeaway, you know, that we have higher levels of metals in these birds. Well, what about public health? Well, EPA funded an environmental justice grant for Fosker to go out and, uh, and actually advertise to the general population, hey, we're here, we want to sample your point of use for water and let you know if, you, if there's anything you should be worried about. So uh, based on the respondents, they were able to sample about 20 homes within a one mile buffer of the Nogales Wash and the Santa Cruz River over a two year period. They found that there were no exceedances for metals, yay, probably because they're all getting tied up in the clays. Uh, but uh, they did find that uh, levels of nitrates, levels of E. coli, and arsenic were elevated in that area. So what they recommended the general population is you guys should probably, especially during the monsoon, sample your well and have it analyzed if you're using it for drinking water purposes. Then there's the whole effluent toxicity requirements associated with the Nogales International. This is in their permit. They actually have to pull samples from their discharge and then they expose it to things like water flea and minnows and they to determine if the if the effluent is toxic. IBWC has had whole effluent toxicity failures with respect to samples that were collected at their outfall specifically for Ceridaphnia dubia. Okay, and this is one example of a notification. They've had multiple. And again, if you go and you look at the literature, you can find with respect to the metals that are, that are in their discharge that, that there's this publication by the USGS, Nickel Hazards to Fish, Wildlife, and Invertebrates. And in that publication, sure enough, they indicate that 13 parts per billion is the LC50, the lethal concentration to kill off 50% of the population of Ceridaphnia dubia um, at 13 parts per billion. And worse, the mixture of metals, if you have other metals that are included in those discharges, they actually compound the toxicity of nickel. Well, I can tell you right now that the discharge from the, from the um, wastewater treatment plant on some days, according to their AZIPTES permit, is much higher than 13 part per billion. So that's probably w one reason why they're failing. They also do ambient monitoring. Uh, about two miles downstream of the Rio Rico Bridge, once a quarter, and we're seeing concentrations, at least in 2015, for nickel at 100 part per billion. So that's an order of magnitude higher than what we need to protect that indicator species, right? Um, they also looked at copper. Copper was also relatively high in the, uh, in the Santa Cruz River, two miles downstream. That's a long way for, for that contamination to, uh, to travel. The issues are further compounded by the fact that in Nogales, Sonora, the topography and its location, we get these killer monsoons that create all this runoff. And um, what that runoff does is it carries all this sediment and it dumps it into the wastewater conveyance system, into the, into the collection system, which runs under the streets, under all the major thoroughfares. So now you've got all this sediment coming into the sewers and you can imagine what's going to happen. That's going to create sanitary sewer overflows all over the city. And where do those sanitary sewer overflows end up? They're going to end up in the Nogales Wash, which is a tributary to the Santa Cruz River. So now it's not even going through the wastewater treatment plant where it has an, an, an opportunity to actually assimilate in the biosolids. Now it's just being discharged directly into a water body of the US. So what do we do about this? So in my unit, uh, I was the chair for, uh, for the Arizona Sonora Water Task Force. We would identify projects that where we could try to do some environmental good. We would work through what's known as the EPA Border 2020 program to find partners to work on projects to mitigate environmental issues in the uh, Arizona Sonora border. So we actually worked with uh, the wastewater utility in Nogales Sonora. We said, hey, we'd say, help us mitigate these metals. And the feedback we got from the wastewater utility was, we'd love to, but we don't have auto samplers, or the auto samplers we have are very old. We're only required to pull one sample from a maquiladora per year. If you want us to go above and beyond, help us out. We're willing to work with you, but we're not going to do this by ourselves. So we used Border 2020 to develop this uh, proposal to actually do a source characterization of all the industrial parks in Nogales, Sonora. To actually go out, install auto samplers in the manholes, and see what we might find. And uh, here was the, the, the proposal. Not only did we get them to buy in with their time, but we also got the city of Phoenix, their wastewater treatment facility located just a couple miles away from here, and Pima County's wastewater treatment facility to cost match us with free analytics 
for samples that we pulled out of the sewer. So because of all this cost matching that we did, we got, we got selected for funding through EPA Border 2020. So uh, at the same time that we're going to be doing all this source characterization, we have that beautiful AZIPTES data that's being collected by IBWC north of the border. So if we find anything in one of these manholes, maybe we can correlate it to what's going on. But let's talk about what's going on south of the border first. So these are all the sample sites. And the idea was to basically rotate amongst all these sample sites with auto samplers, pull samples, have them analyzed, and then look at the data and see what it tells us. Now, I could go on with my presentation, show you the results, but I thought it would be more interesting if I actually showed you um, the monitoring that's taking place. And this first slide is the, the folks that I worked with in Ogala, Sonora. This is the head of the pretreatment program in Ogala, Sonora. She runs the lab. These are our field techs. Manuel is also a field tech. Great people. They want to work with us. They want to resolve the issue. They just don't have a lot of money or resources. So when you come to the table, they're all about, all right, let's work hand in hand and let's fix this problem. So this is a manhole. That's one of the GLS auto samplers that we purchased through uh, Border 2020. And, uh, and they're actually doing 24-hour time-weighted composites at this particular uh, manhole over the course of 14 days. So that's what it looks like to install an auto sampler. It's not as pretty as the sites that you guys get to work in, you know, these beautiful natural areas. Here's another one. This is actually, that collector is actually in the Nogales wash. And upstream of this collector, um, and this is, this is running a little slow, sorry about that, there's a metal plating facility. And that metal plating facility discharges, and we can get an idea of what they're discharging by sampling this manhole. That GLS auto sampler right there that you see, I was able to work with the city of Phoenix in 2004 to get that donated. That was surplus equipment that they were going to auction off, and they gave it to the city of Nogales, Sonora. That was 14, 14 years ago, 15 years ago. They're still using that auto sampler, which was considered surplus equipment by the city of Phoenix. But that shows you how resource constrained this community of 300,000, which is responsible for 90% of the effluent <laughs> that's a discharge, is, is, is working with right now. So um, here you, you see them installing this uh, GLS auto sampler. That's a little homemade hanger that they made because they couldn't afford to make to purchase one from ISCO for 500 bucks, so they would just make their own. And, uh, and that big manhole cover that you see right there, the reason it's so big and heavy is because this is in the wash. And when the wash starts to flow, they want something big and heavy so that the top doesn't come off. Here's another site that we monitored in a very important industrial park. This picture right here was after the first day of, this is us coming back after 24 hours to collect the sampler. And this is what we found. We found a tire where a manhole used to be. And the, the, the auto sampler was actually down in the bottom of the manhole. The hanger had been removed. And we're like, what's going on? And what happened was somebody decided that they wanted the manhole maybe as a counter lever for, for, for a garage door or something. So they just took the manhole. But at least they were nice enough to put a tire with some reflective material so that cars that were going by could go around them and not fall inside the manhole. But these are the challenges we're dealing with while we're, while we're monitoring in Nogales, Sonora. So this is them actually collecting their sample. Uh, we did get a little bit of sample before the, uh, um, before the uh, uh, auto sampler was dumped into the bottom of the manhole. And what they do is they, they, they shake it, then they do a, a pour, then they'll close it, and then they'll vigorously agitate the, uh, the sample bottle before they do another pour. So they've got really good technique. They've actually been trained by the City of Phoenix uh, pretreatment folks. And then they'll take a, a, a little bit of a pour off that. Here's them coming back to Colinas de Liaki. They actually concrete, you know, put concrete around the, the, the cover of that manhole because they didn't want anybody to steal their auto sampler. Imagine doing this over and over again for 30 days, right? And here they pulled it out, and here Manuel notices that the sampler only pulled one sample, which is bad. We want, you know, uh, we want multiple samples for our composite. So what is going on? Why did it only pull? And they noticed something was obstructing the uh, sampler tubing in the, uh, in the manhole. And this is what they pulled out. It's like a, uh, like a, 
So what happened was it obstructed the inlet to the auto sampler. And we don't know if this was done on purpose by the facility that was upstream. Because of that obstruction, it destroyed this auto sampler. It no longer works, unfortunately. This auto sampler that they'd had for 14 years. But it was a good opportunity because what it allowed us to do was it allowed me to say, well, we didn't get the sample, but we have to pull a sample. Let's go upstream and see if there's a manhole downstream of this metal plating facility right here. So we went upstream, and sure enough, they were batch discharging one of those tanks that I mentioned. And look at the color of that discharge. So we measured the flow, and we pulled the sample. And uh, that's what the sample looked like. Now, if you, put that, if you put that sample in a glass, it fluoresces yellow. What we found out later on is that's a dye that they add. They coat their, their, uh, their plated fixtures, and then they'll put them under UV light to make sure that they, were, that they were totally coated. So that's why that sample looks the way it does. And sure enough, when we ran the sample on this, it came back, Pima County ran the analysis, it came back, I think it was 65,000 part per billion, which is way above the standard of what's allowed. And sure enough, after we pulled the sample, I went back to look, and guess what? There's no more discharge, or it's very low discharge, suggesting that this was a tank that they had emptied out. So it was kind of nice. Here's the other thing I'm gonna show you real quick. You see this pipe right here? You see how it's exposed in the Nogales wash? That's not good. This is supposed to go to uh, another collector that comes in over here. The fact that this pipe is buckling in the Nogales wash means that all you need is a big flood to come, break the pipe, and now all of a sudden you don't have wastewater going to the wastewater treatment plant. It's being discharged directly into the Nogales wash. Yeah. Right. So here are the first five samples that we collected. We compared them with nickel to see what the standard for nickel was to see if it would be an indication. The color was an indication. Nickel's a different color, but there it is, Pima County. So I would drive these up to Pima County every two or three days, and then they would run the, the analyses and they would give us the results. So this is for your benefit. Um, we would move those samplers to different manholes, and every time they'd move them, they would make sure that all their sampler tubing was, was replaced and they would also acid wash anything like any permanent metal fixture in the, uh, to make sure that uh, there wasn't any cross contamination between one site and the other. So these guys are very professional. I mean, they know what they're doing. The challenge for them is they just don't have the resources to do it, is the bottom line. So there they are at the border, and, and this is interesting because one day they, they were collecting a sample right at the border, and we could actually see IBWC on the other side of the border. That's the U.S.-Mexico border pulling a sample from manhole one, which we're going to compare to later on. So it's kind of interesting to, to see this in action. So there they are, and they're, uh, and they're basically putting a counterweight. And I don't know if you can hear it, but this is the sound of 12 million gallons per day of effluent coming into um, uh, Nogales, Arizona. And the material they used for that counterweight, we made sure that it didn't contain any of the metals that were, uh, that were sampled. And that basically is just, just so you guys know, when I show you a bunch of data, data's not very much fun unless you know where it comes from and all the challenges that, that we had to go through. <laughs> so, um, all right, let me go back to the presentation. So here are the results. Um, this is the data that was analyzed by Pima County and the city of Phoenix. We did pull duplicates. We did pretty good. 14 of our 16 parameters within, were within 10% for Pima County, and all of our parameters were within 10% for the samples that were analyzed by, um, by city of Phoenix. So we had good QAQC on, on, our, uh, on our sampling. And this is just kind of a summary. This is all the data presented in tabular format. We only analyzed for those metals that we were most interested in. Chromium, copper, nickel, and zinc. Those are the an samples analyzed by Pima County, City of Phoenix. And then Omapas also did some analyses. And then these are all the collectors. We couldn't monitor all six of the collectors for, we actually, because we didn't have enough auto samplers, we had to come up with a sample plan that would rotate the auto samplers amongst the city. But that basically is a summary of all the data. So here are the results. Remember, the idea behind this is source characterization, where the metal's coming from. So with respect to chromium, we could see that we were getting results from, or higher numbers from Nuevo Nogales and Colinas. Okay, keep that in mind. With respect to copper, Nuevo Nogales again, and Colinas. With respect to nickel, Nuevo Nogales again, and Colinas. And then with respect to zinc, Colinas and Jesus Garcia. I should mention that Colinas, 
is that one manhole where we pulled the grab sample, and we didn't include it as part of this analysis, but uh, that one sample that came up really high in nickel. There's only one industrial facility upstream. All right, so this is just in looking at the 98% confidence interval for those results. And you can see here that for you know chromium, copper, nickel, and zinc, you know, chromium, copper, nickel, nuevo nogales. All right, great. We know where our metals are coming from. This is good progress. We you know we've done our source characterization, right? We also looked at the results at manhole one, and we wanted to see if the data actually correlated um, for these industrial parks. Remember that the IOI brings that data from Mexico into Arizona, so right at the border, IBWC is doing their AZIPTES required monitoring. Uh, and that's the, the period of time when IBWC was doing their concurrent monitoring. And here are the results. So for chromium, here's all the different industrial parks that we're discharging over time. And you can kind of see that for chromium, Nuevo Nogales, which is this blue bar, kind of tracks with what IBWC is reporting at manhole one. So now, not only have we identified a source, but we can say that that source is correlated to spikes that we're seeing at manhole one at the border. So that's important. Uh, these are the chromium loadings. Uh, the, those spikes that you see right there, um, if you compare that to the engineering specs for the wastewater treatment plant, will impact the quality of the biosolids at the plant. It's the reason the plant can't discharge of their biosolids land apply, they have to send them to a landfill. Here's copper. So again, Nuevo Nogales is the blue one on the top. You can see that we, we have correlations here. So we should be looking at those facilities in Nuevo Nogales. And with respect to copper, they're actually discharging at levels that according to the engineering specs for the plant will likely impact the effluent that's being discharged. I should also mention that the AZIPTES permit does not require IBWC to report to us when the levels uh, that, uh, that are discharged are above permit levels associated with their DMRs. So this is pretreatment monitoring that's aside from their DMR discharge. So if we have data that here that says, you guys violated a standard for discharge, they don't have to report that to us. Uh, here's uh, nickel, again, Nuevo Nogales, there it is, man. If you compare all the, all the parks, there it is. Um, and uh, for nickel, which was really interesting, everything was really kosher. The interesting thing about this is we actually approached the maquiladores and we let them know that we were going to be doing this, this study. And the other thing is, is that we said, we really want to focus on nickel. We, they, they know that nickel's a big deal for all the reasons that we spoke about earlier. Look how low nickel was while we were doing this monitoring. Isn't that interesting? In fact, <laughs> During the period of our monitoring, we saw nickel loadings that we hadn't seen that low for the last six years. So if you think about it in terms of plan, do, check, adjust, maybe the fact that Omapas was out there every day in front of the maquiladoras, in front of their facilities, opening manholes, maybe it had an impact. Maybe it was just coincidence. Uh, and then for zinc, again, you know, for zinc, uh, Colina Steliaki seems to be an industrial park that's a big issue for us. For zinc, uh, zinc is a problem for the biology of the plant. When we get these spikes, IBWC has to add a whole bunch of nutrients to the, um, to the reactors to make sure that the bugs don't die off. They, they just go to sleep. So the conclusions of the study were that during the month of June 2018, uh, IBWC witnessed intermittent levels of metals that approached ex or exceeded guidance for protecting the wastewater treatment plant. And we also identified those source industrial parks that we could correlate to those exceedances at manhole one. That's a pretty big deal, because now we know where to focus, right, for source mitigation. And we're saying that increased visibility by the utility may have contributed to the lowest nickel loadings measured in manhole one since 2012. That's a big deal. These are the priority areas. For chromium, copper, and nickel, we should be focused on that industrial park right there based on the data analysis. For chromium and zinc, Golina Stelyaki, which is downstream of that metal plating facility that I showed you the little multimedia presentation on. And then uh, this industrial park, California, is probably a source of chromium. So now what do we do, right? It's like we have all this beautiful data. We have these industrial parks. We know where we need to focus. So I took, I took the team out to lunch and I said, well, guys, what do we do now? You know, they said, well, we don't know because this was great. We really appreciate it, but we're not required to do this under our own Mexican uh, standards for, for pretreatment. 
we're only required to pull one sample per year from each industrial outfall, for each permitted industrial outfall. So this is great, but it's not likely that we're going to be pulling one sample a year that we're actually going to capture an exceedance and we can do some, some compliance action against these facilities. So I asked them, if I can get you analytical, if I can do more cost match, if I can do the analysis, they said, absolutely, we would love to do it. We don't want to contaminate Arizona. We just don't have the resources to do it. So these were the recommended actions. Investigate options pr for providing laboratory support to OMAPAS for monitoring not of industrial parks, but of specific industrial facilities so that they could follow through with the compliance action. And then also look at uh, certifying the U.S. labs, the U.S. side labs, which are already providing pro bono support and saying that they want to continue doing it, get them certified by Mexico so that those results can be used for compliance. So those were the results of the, of the study. And we presented all this to what's known as the Southeast Arizona Citizens Forum Board, which is a, uh, an advisory group made up of citizens, including Representative uh, Gabaldon, uh, uh, Barbara Escobar, who runs the Pima County Lab, Chuck Graff, who used to be Deputy Director of ADQ. All these people sit on this board, and they make recommendations to IBWC regarding things that they want to see happen. So we gave this presentation to the Southeast Arizona Citizens Forum Board, and guess what? They, they followed through. They wrote a letter to, uh, to the IBWC commissioner saying, this was a great study. We want to see IBWC support the wastewater utility with, um, with credits for laboratory. If not, we want to see you guys look at doing a certification of labs that are willing to do pro bono work, right? Not only that, they want to look at the impact of respective efforts to see what impact it has, looking at this beautiful AZIPTES data that IBWC is already required to collect. Wow, this was a win-win-win. Great. We got a letter back from IBWC. And to make a long story short, IBWC indicated that uh, they already do a lot of work through the Binational Technical Committee meetings. You know, like, that's our venue for sharing, and uh, that's the best we can do. Well, Mexico doesn't work that way. Mexico wants to see people at the table with resources, like the Border 2020 project, and they're more than willing to work with us. But to just come and say, here's a problem, fix it, that's not going to work for them, right? So my question was to my former unit, I went and spoke to my replacement. And I said, well, you know, there's not a lot going on on the IBWC front. What is OBEP currently doing, or what's now known as the Office of Legislative Affairs? So the actions that have taken place over the last year is they followed through with specific maquiladoras, which are suspected of, of, of causing problems with letters. And I know Trevor Bajori was, was involved with that to say, hey, we've got a problem here. Help us out, right? Um, they've attended a few OPSA meetings, which are meetings of the regulated community, and they've also met with, uh, with the public utility. That's great. That's important, but it's only part of the puzzle. Really what we need is resource leveraging. And they indicated that they're still receiving the quarterly reports from IBWC. They're copied on the AZIPTES data requirements, but they're not, apparently they're not going to be doing much with that data anymore. I think the, the focus is we're going to push this off on IBWC and let them deal with it which is understandable. I mean, we're an overtaxed agency with limited resources, and at the same time, it is a little frustrating because here we found a path forward. We know we can make an impact, and we can't, um, you know, we're not following that thread, unfortunately. So, so what's happened over the last year, you know, in this, in the, in this new context of, all right, well, we're going to step back. We're going to try to negotiate. Well, map us, you're on your own for the time being. Well, let's use PDCA. Let's see how it's impacting the metal loadings from Mexico, particularly nickel, which is the one that we really care about. So it's going up, right? Uh, so th this was the last update that was posted to the performance board for OBEP. So uh, you can see that nickel is slowly rising. We received first quarter data from IBWC, but there was never any update to the performance board. So I went ahead and I took a look at it myself. That's where we are in the first quarter of 2019. So nickel's back on the rise. So that indicates that, to me anyway, in the context of PDCA and you know, plan, do, check, adjust, that it would be helpful if we adjusted a little bit here. If we went back into Mexico, if we, if we work with the regulators, if we provided them the resources we need to mitigate uh, you know, toxicity failures in the Santa Cruz River. That's a small price to pay, in my opinion. 
So what's happened with respect to ambient monitoring? Well, Mindy Cross actually gave me the heads up earlier this year that uh, IBWC, sure enough, uh, shared some uh, monitoring data, not for 2015-16, but for 2017-18. And sure enough, we're seeing levels of nickel two miles downstream of the wastewater treatment plant that um, are above what's required for protecting Serodaphnia dubia. Remember the LC50 for Serodaphnia dubia is only 13 parts per billion. And in February of 2019, uh, IBWC informed ADQ of toxicity failures for Serodaphnia dubia. Okay, this is the first time I've ever heard of this where we've actually, where IBWC actually reported toxicity failures in the Santa Cruz River, not at the effluent of the plant, but two miles downstream. And that happened in February of this year. So in my opinion, it's not a problem, it's an opportunity, right? Uh, we should be looking at this, what we've done in the past, what's worked, and following up accordingly. So that's basically my uh, presentation. I appreciate everybody coming and, and bearing with me through this show, but I'm new to a lot of you folks, and I wanted you guys to have a little bit of an understanding of, of what my background was coming into the Watershed Protection Unit. This is about 30% of my time working for OBEP. So thank you very much. <laughs>